Good afternoon and welcome to our regular council meeting uh, of Monday, March 28th, 2022. Uh, first item on the agenda, item 1.1, conflict of interest, declaration, pecuniary or non-pecuniary. Are there any in the room this evening? Seeing none, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Councillor Chapman. Well, thank you, Mayor Van Ryan, uh, through to council on under closed meeting of 13.0 will be uh, the Chamber of Commerce awards achievements 13.2 uh, uh, and I'll have a conflict as I have a nomination in as well. Okay, thank you. For clarity for the sake of the minutes, this is a non-pecuniary conflict of interest, Councillor Chapman. Okay, thank you. Okay, so item 2.1, the uh, regular council meeting agenda for today's meeting. Are there any additions to the agenda? See none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, item 13.1, the uh, regular council meeting minutes from March 14, 2022. Everybody had a chance to go through them as part of your agenda package. Uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Avery. Uh, thank you, Mayor Van Ryan. 13.2, uh, um, sale of temporary Westland Insurance Building, I was opposed to that. So I would uh, approve them as amended. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, can I get someone or uh, all those in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. Business arising from the minutes. Uh, Mel, we're going to have um, our Kim Craig do a uh, presentation here in a couple of minutes. So Kim, if you want to sit down and get organized. And we have um, Kim Craig, representative from Southern Alberta Energy from Waste Association. Uh, welcome, Kim. And uh, before you go ahead with the update, could I get you to do me a favor for the sake of council, kind of give us some history about what uh, the program is all about, and, uh, and then you can give us your update as well. I'm Ryan and council. Uh, well, the part of the presentation was embedded in the update for the history, but for a brief a bit, the history of Sewa goes back about, for me, about 2008 when we were a group of uh, well-meaning people that were meeting regularly to discuss a better alternative to landfilling, and then it evolved over a number of years, and I was the chair of SEWA for over six years. I've been an executive member for all the time I've been with SEWA. So SEWA's uh, started, the genesis of SEWA was Balkan area, the uh, Balkan uh, land uh, manage, waste management people wanted to do, they were first going to start a landfill way back, uh, you know, over 20 years ago. And they had an epiphany that maybe there's a better way of dealing with the municipal salt waste and just burying it and so the county of Vulcan and the town of Vulcan went together and got a grant from Rural Development Alberta and the, that was basically the genesis of SEWA because the, that uh, they wouldn't let us call it a feasibility study for but for lack of better words a feasibility study said it was a good idea and there was potential for it so then over the time I've been with SEWA, I've been able to go to a number of different uh, similar uh, waste energy plants, one in the uh, Burnaby metro region in Vancouver, one in Portland, Oregon, and another one in Seattle, Washington. So I've seen it firsthand how they work and that. So I've been on the committee, as I said, but you know, in, we have one member that's been on there as long, almost as long as me, and he's the, the technical guy because he lives in Hatshaw and he's in the shadow of uh, two big smoke stacks that uh, a cement company has there and he's well acquainted with the land, airshed legislation etc so 
that's really a thumbnail of the Sewa, and uh, so you know, I really appreciate you inviting me, like I said, and, and on behalf of Sewa, you know, we really want to pass our thanks to town council for naming me as the representative because the municipal elections of 2021 saw a fair number of familiar faces around the executive table and the board room table change and that so uh, appointing me as a member at large if you will uh, kept that continuity in the corporate memory at the table for Sewa so uh, you know we had an orientation meeting and I was able to you know, shed a lot of light on the, the actual project and the pitfalls and whatnot that we've had. And, you know, a number of people at this table have endured a number of SAWA reports over the years as well. So when uh, Councillor Chapman uh, is the appointed uh, alternate, and I thank you for doing that. So that's uh, really good to have that support. And so with Council, I, I'm aware that you have the, this PowerPoint in your package as well as a January 28th and February 25th uh, updates from SEWA in the package. So I'm hopeful that you are all had a chance to at least scan it and be familiar with it. But, you know, I wouldn't mind running through quickly the um, PowerPoint and I won't la belabor it. So as the mission statement says, you'll re reduce reliance on... Uh, Landfilling. Next slide, Lana, please. Then this is sort of the roadmap as we have. So Q1 funding applications to move forward with the expression for interest review and selection. And uh, Q2, Q1 strategize towards development of the inclusion framework and engagement plan. And so we've already adopted a land acknowledgement statement at the beginning of all the SEWA meetings and uh, adopted an inclusive uh, framework for going forward. And then we're Q223, uh, do formal public engagement as we move through to do pu the public process of what the waste energy facility will look like. And then, you know, over following that review and selection of the uh, vendor technology and then as we move into Q4 start the transitioning process for uh, taking uh, say what to a non-profit commercial and en corporate entity so that's a municipally co controlled corporation and we have the that corporation sitting on the shelf uh, through Brown Lee office already so we can evolve into the MCC as soon as we need to the economic benefits a slide up there shows a lot of work that's gone on and this was in support of the facility in Newell County and you know the I won't belabor the numbers but there's lots of uh, impact the economic on this thing uh, when we way back in the beginning of time when uh, in say what terms we thought of this as only a waste energy project and an alternative way of treating municipal solid waste but then it dawned on us that this is also a huge economic development opportunity. You know, uh, 500 to 700 million dollars in capital costs and uh, labor costs and uh, ongoing operational costs and the uh, spin-off of the uh, outputs of electricity and uh, district heat. So there's a lot, and then also the recycling of uh, ferrous, non-ferrous metals, etc. that can happen. So that's just a little thumb sketch of what we put together to support the application for us uh, Newell. Next slide, Lana. Then this is a waste stream characterization. Uh, some of the hard working taxpayer dollars went toward uh, doing a, a characterization of the waste in the system back in 2016. And you know this basically shows you know that there's lots of volume there other than uh, recyclable materials to take up for uh, a waste energy plant and uh, right now there's an ad hoc committee at SEWA revising and going back over the methodology of the waste stream characterization and updating census numbers and whatnot just to see if we're current because that you know that's almost uh, six years old data and as a lot of us know that recycling has changed over the last little while and China is not accepting all the plastics it used to and Glass doesn't go where it used to and different other things. So it's an evolving uh, dynamic situation with uh, the waste stream characterization. Next slide, Lana. So this is just a 
basic uh, simple sketch of what a waste energy plant would look like. Uh, say we're back when we uh, do, made the decision to uh, authorize a municipally controlled corporation, basically uh, approved mass burn as a technology, and but in the REOI that we uh, put out in the system, it didn't limit the technology specifically to mass burn. It, it gave it open a little bit of opening for new and innovative proven technology as well. So it, that just shows, you know, in the plants that I've been at, you know, you can w walk up to that plant, and unless the bunker door is open, you can't really, you can't smell or anything like that. If the bunker door is open for a truck to go in, you might catch a whiff or, you know, definitely when you're in the bunker, that's a whole different thing. Uh, but, you know, garbage does smell. But, you know, the, the neat thing about that plant is, unlike a landfill, when that plant, if it, you know, right now the Burnaby plant is over 30 years old and they're retrofitting and whatnot. So our lifestyle, life cycle analysis is based on 30 years, but you know, these plants can be uh, retrofitted and upgraded and that, so they have potentially a longer life cycle. But at the end of this life cycle, you can uh, take away all the metal and, and bulldoze all this stuff down and you, you have a fairly clean site as opposed to a landfill where it's all buried and Lord only knows what's underneath there and, and for years and years to come. So the, a landfill will have a closure, post-closure costs going infinitely where this one would, you can basically call it a day if you have to move on to something else or go to a different facility type thing. So uh, next slide, Lana. So this is the work that's been completed thus far. Uh, you know, a fair bit of engineering work and, and all that stuff that has uh, gone on. You know, and then interesting note about this is that we don't have a team of engineers other than the contracted ones. You know, when when I was, uh, when we met with people from Dor Durham on the landfill, uh, their waste energy project, they had, you know, high powered engineers, you know, that were, you know, working full time every day on this project, whereas, Myself and my fellow board members and an executive director have done most of the work. Uh, so a lot of volunteer hours have gone in, and we've accomplished a, a whole lot with you know limited resources type thing. And and we've been able to do it in a strange environment because in Alberta, sometimes urban rules. You know, you might not newer council members might not know it, but. Uh, the rules and the urban sometimes don't get along, and so it, sometimes at a at a meeting with a blend of urban and rules, it was a little bit uh, interesting. But the neat thing was that everybody believed in the concept of not uh, continuing on with landfilling as the one and only solution going forward. So that kept us united when you know other uh, feelings kind of took us a different direction. Next one, Lana. So then this is still an overview, but we're looking at a 300,000 ton a year uh, facility, and the outputs are you know, about 50 uh, megawatts of electricity a year and a million uh, tons of processed steam or district heat, if you will. So, you know, the district heat could be used for you know, something like a, an array of greenhouses if you wanted it to, or, or the uh, electricity could power up to about 28,000 homes. So the tipping fees haven't been finalized yet, but you know, I think around the council table, the, you'll know that your tipping fees are in excess of what, 125 or 130 dollars a ton right now. And so it's, uh, you can do a lot, you know, you can pay a lot of trucking fees uh, if you can manage the tipping fee element to this project quite well. So then the greenhouse gas reductions, you know, this isn't something that we just pulled all the Ethernet, you know, we, we, we did a lot of work, the engineers did it, and it's been peer reviewed to fat, you know, fat check that number. So over the life cycle of a 30 year plant, we estimate about 7 million tons of greenhouse gas uh, reductions over the year. So. Uh, HDR is our engineers of record, so they're a world-class uh, engineering firm that have really no bias. They, if you, you can pay them to do a landfill for you, or you can pay them to do a waste energy and whatnot. So they're they're not 
they're not biased in the project that way. And uh, so, so far, we've uh, worked with this kind of money that we, as the worst kept secret maybe in the room is we just got another grant for about 149,000. So the senior level of governments have pushed this up to over 1.6 million in the grant funding. The municipal support is a combination of you know what it took for you know my per capita you know my uh, cost allowance of going to a meeting and back you know the hourly uh, per diem that not, might be calculated and by way of all the members that go to the meetings and whatnot you know for example for the last almost uh, 13 years uh, two meetings a month for me and so you factor that in amongst the organization then since about 2012 there was a per capita uh, assessment on most municipalities so that's what that number equals next then this again is just reinforcing uh, the math uh, on greenhouse gas emissions relative to the landfilling. So you know, we're 95% better than a landfill in efficiency with when you look at landfilling versus uh, the waste energy concept. So next, uh, Lana. So then we did send out a uh, earlier uh, expression for interest on siting and. This was, you know, our engineers and record were just blown away by the fact that we had so many responses to this uh, call out for people that were willing to maybe go into the beauty pageant for sites for this project. And, uh, you know, while I have a bias that Coldale was probably one of the prettiest candidates on the runway, uh, the, the sad truth is that science and economics and uh, all the reason and logic that you have to have for a project like this uh, prevailed. And, uh, you know, sadly to say, or happily, you know, the winning uh, bid was from the county of Newell. Next one, Lana. And so this is why, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, good reasons on why uh, Newell was the better site. They're right next to a landfill already, and they have a you know, lots of infrastructure right now, and they have a, a little company called JBS uh, that uh, works with uh, beef and meat packing, and they might be an ancillary customer or even, you know, a supplier of some of their waste product as well. So a lot of good synergy for that site as well. So next, Lana. So like I say, we, we did a robust expansion of interest on the for the vendor technology net, so we put it up on the normal purchasing sites and had the closing date, and we were assisted by uh, HDR and a uh, group of people from the Sewa uh, table that, uh, you know, Paul Ryan, the project lead, and another person that has a lot of economic development background kind of worked on that steering committee. We were really happy with the drawdown of uh, documents, 29 different companies. You know, some of them were lawyers that were, you know, either doing it on behalf of uh, undisclosed third party or uh, maybe looking at, you know, what the project looks like in case they might uh, do some work for whoever down the road type thing. So it wasn't necessarily all uh, technology vendors, but, you know, you know at the end of the day, uh, we wanted to we wanted to have this one done before the municipal elections, and uh, we we had the first part done. We had the responses come in for the ROI net Lana. and so we, this is uh, some of the next steps that we have to do uh, going forward, and so that will all be happening. And a lot of it was done in the in our uh, feasibility study already. Net Lana. so these are the major international companies that responded to the REOI uh, for the technology and uh, you know there it gave us a lot of uh, you know uh, confidence of the project because these these are multi-billion dollar players that you know aren't thinking that you're uh, a, a pretend uh, kind of a thing you know it, it's not you know, it's a real deal, and these uh, these players have lots of money to come to the table with. So it is pretty interesting. And then this is the one of the most recent uh, plants in uh, Canada, in Durham, Durham, York region in Ontario, and 
that small snap picture is a little bit uh, deceiving because really part of that uh, affluent is probably just a, the difference between the atmospheric temperature rather than any uh, amount of affluent going all over the stack. That's kind of. Then, you know, if you want to be creative, you can uh, uh, plant in Germany, incorporated a ski hill uh, with it. Uh, I've seen pictures of plants near the, along the Seine River where they kind of disguise the stack as a uh, the smoke stack of a riverboat cruise liner going down. So when you're in, on the Seine River, you you think of, there's a rounded river you know, cruise cruise liner there, and some of the stacks even have uh, observation towers near the top, so people can go up and look around their uh, geographic area. So. It's pretty interesting stuff. So, you know, the plant that I visited in uh, Portland, you had the electric energy plant, and right next door you could throw a, you hit a nine iron, well, maybe not me, but some better golf players could hit a nine iron and hit a cow. Uh, that's how close, you know, the interaction between uh, rural uh, farming is and, and the actual waste energy plant. And the one in Spokane is just, right in the line of sight with the, their airport down there. And it, it kind of has the housing of uh, industrial park as part of its uh, business model as well. So it's pretty cool. So that's the end of the slideshow. I know council loves pictures. I used to like them a lot too. Uh, so then uh, we're, I think Lana did me a solid by handing out the March 25th uh, briefing update. Uh, also, I alluded to the other ones, but you know, just want to highlight quickly that you know the expressions of interest. You know, three very significant players. Again, the mission statement for SEWA is basically dealing with municipal solid waste that's non-recyclable, and then the potential outputs, as I already said, you know, the five uh, megawatts of electricity for about 28,000 residences, or a thousand tons a year of. Uh, steam or district heat, the greenhouse reductions. You hear a lot of governments talking that they want to reduce greenhouse gases and whatnot, where we come to the table offering 7 million tons over a 30 year life cycle. And you know, it, it just boggles my mind that we have a hard time uh, getting some buy-in on some senior levels of government for that. But uh, then, you know, the waste energy, uh, some of the analysis on the new old thing shows, I believe, that you know, we have a, a real deal project in that. So um, then you know, I'm really pleased, again, to confirm that you know, we were approved with, for 149,964 Alberta Community Partnership Grant. So this makes it possible to use some of that money to finalize the evaluation and the request for the expressions of interest for vendor technology. So that work will be moving forward really close. When we were a little unsure about the funding and that, we even had one member pony up to the table and donated $10,000 of their own cash to make, to, to make a statement on how significant you know, he felt that save his contribution to society was. So that was quite heartwarming. You know, so in conclusion, there's over 1,500 pages of reports and uh, engineering materials on our SAVA website. So if any member of council is suffering from insomnia, I encourage you to visit SAVA.com.ca uh, and uh, peruse the 1,500 uh, pages. Uh, the briefing was meant, of course, to give you a bit of history, background, and update you on the current progress of SAVA. And uh, I feel pretty confident that we're on a positive track right now. And, uh, you know, this, this might have triggered now or, you know, when you go home and think about it more questions, if you, that happens, feel free to give me a call or get, you know, run it through Bill and him and I can figure out the answers or whatnot. Or, you know, if, you, if this is sort of uh, piqued your curiosity but also some skepticism, we can arrange for our uh, technical uh, guru, Paul Ryan, to update council and give a more in-depth technical uh, briefing because, you know, I'm the sizzle and he's the steak more, more or less in this uh, equation. He might not like that analogy, but what the heck, he's not here. And then also, SEWA generates updates frequently that I try to pass on, and Councillor Bill probably uh, passes on as well. So I hope I kept within my time frame. So. You did well, Kim. Thank you. Any questions for Kim? 
Councilor Chapman. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Ben Ryan. To uh, Kim Craig, uh, thank you so much for attending and thank you for all your hard work at the table on this uh, dear project. My question uh, to you uh, mainly is, is about commercial waste. And I think that there would be more, a lot more appetite for, for uh, uh, destination for commercial waste over domestic waste as, as a need for Alberta. Well, you know, that's an interesting point. Of course, uh, you know, that waste stream characterization that I showed you uh, shows a lot of commercial waste within that, uh, and we're, we're well, well aware of it. We're hope, we know that we want to size the planet at 300,000 tons a year to make it efficient, because the one thing you don't want to have is, you know, the economy of scale is very important to this process. If you're going to spend, a lot of the money that's going to be spent is on the uh, scrubbing and the environmental mitigation on the plant, and so to make it pay off, you need the economy of scale. So we anticipate a lot of merchant capacity, like you said, you know, and in the different other plants that I saw, you know, there were, uh, um, uh, municipal police forces and whatnot that use that plant, you know, under secured protocol to destroy records and, and different uh, things and, and other, you know, medical waste and all sorts of things. And so the, you know, when the blue, bird flu hit Vancouver, uh, well, Canada, back uh, the, in the day, there, you can see there's pictures of trucks hauling uh, poultry to the waste energy plant and that. So, you know, the, they're a robust plant that are multi-purpose, so uh, commercial waste would be, you know, give us merchant capacity so that, you know, like I said, perhaps if you have a $50 per ton uh, tipping fee for municipalities, you're going to have a higher rate for the merchant capacity that will uh, make the, the plant uh, basically, you know, for the lack of a better word, subsidize the, the municipal portion of it. So. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, can I get someone to make a motion to receive the Southern Alberta Energy from Waste Association report as information? Councillor Chapman, any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay, thank you again, Kim. Thank you. You as well. Okay, moving on to agenda item 5.2. We have uh, a property tax assessment presentation, uh, benchmark consultants. We have uh, Lance Waylogi and our CFO, Kyle uh, Beauchamp, uh, presenting this evening. So, welcome, Lance. Kyle, the floor is yours. Thanks and good evening. Yeah, so uh, we have Lance Waylog from uh, Benchmark Consultant. So property tax is kind of a twofold thing and, and we're coming up to that fairly soon here with council. So uh, the first part that Lance does is the, you know, the actual assessment of the properties within the town. So we kind of wanted to bring him in here to kind of give council a, um, just a short brief presentation kind of on the theory behind assessment um, valuation for the town of Coaldale. Just for a timeline perspective, um, in April, May here, I will be bringing back to council the property tax bylaw for review. So anything financial specific on the property taxes, we will be bringing back to council next month. Um, I'll just have Lance go through kind of, again, the property tax assessment here and kind of the theory behind that. So uh, without being said, I'll turn over to Lance. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Beauchamp, and uh, thank you, Your Worship, and members of council for, for welcoming here, uh, welcoming me here. Um, my name, as Mr. Beauchamp said, is Lance Wielagi. Uh, I'm an accredited municipal assessor of Alberta, and I am one of the owners of Benchmark Assessment Consultants, and uh, I am the assessor for the town of Coaldale. Um, <clears throat> the intent of this presentation, as Mr. Beauchamp said, is to uh, really inform council uh, of the year-over-year -year changes in the assessment base. Um, so specifically in, in two areas, market change and assessment growth. Uh, but since this is a, a new, uh, new council where there are new members, um, I also added a few pieces in on the assessment function just to give uh, new members a little background of the assessment function uh, as well as, uh, as existing members. Maybe just a, a reminder since assessment uh, really doesn't come up uh, on a day-to-day -day basis but rather maybe a, an annual basis. So we'll start off with the introduction to assessment and then we'll move into the, uh, the assessment role itself. 
So what, what is an assessment? So uh, an assessment, a property assessment, is, is simply uh, assigning a dollar value to property for the purposes of taxation. Uh, now in Alberta, which is a little bit different than say our, our neighbors in Saskatchewan, we, we prepare assessments on an annual basis. And assessments are always, uh, well they're based on two valuation standards, market value and regulated value, but the majority of property in the town of Coaldale is a, a market value standard. And for the 2022 tax year, the assessments reflect the market value of property as of July 1st, 2021 based on the physical condition of that property, December 31st, 2021. So we, we get a lot of questions. Uh, for example, someone will build a, a detached garage in November. Um, they say, well, that's, that's after the valuation date of July 1st. Uh, two dates there that uh, are, are critically important. So anything that is in place uh, as of the, the end of the year of 2021 is assessable, but we assess it as of July 1st, 2021. So market value is a very, very basic concept that I think we're all familiar with. It's essentially what a property is going to sell for in the open marketplace. Uh, one concept that might not be so uh, common is, is mass appraisal. So assessor in Alberta is legislated to prepare properties, uh, property assessments using mass appraisal. And what mass appraisal is, is essentially uh, the grouping of similar properties uh, into stratifications using the uh, common data within those stratifications, so market sales, cost data, uh, income and expenses uh, data, to derive a valuation model which is applied back to that stratification, uh, which ultimately becomes uh, an estimate of value or, or your assessment of property. So when, when an assessor talks about property, uh, he's talking about uh, uh, essentially land uh, improvements or uh, land and improvements. Um, under the improvement side of things, we, we assess structures, which essentially are buildings, anything attached to a structure. So, for example, if you have a, a, a crane way and a crane and an industrial shop and the, and the crane moves, um, that's still attached to the structure, we would assess that. Uh, designated manufactured homes and machinery and equipment. Machinery and equipment, uh, of course, is exempt from taxation in the town of Coldell, but, of course, not, not every municipality uh, exempts machinery and equipment. Machinery and equipment is just anything used in, in processing and manufacturing. So what's important, so after uh, an assessor uh, prepares an assessment by way of its, its value, the assessor has to assign one of the four classes, uh, the assessment classes, uh, as per the Municipal Government Act. So um, class one, residential, so your single family dwellings, your residential condominiums, vacant residential land. Uh, class two, non-residential, so in, uh, it'd be your industrial, your commercial, um, farmland, and, and then machine and equipment. What, what's important about the assessment classes is that council um, can set a tax rate, municipal tax rate for each of the assessment classes uh, with the caveat that class two and class four, non-residential and machine or equipment, they have to be the same. So essentially, Council, unless there's any sub-assessment uh, by law in place, can have three tax rates, one for the non-residential machinery equipment, one for the farmland, one for the residential. So the last piece before moving into uh, the market change is uh, assessment standards. So when an assessor prepares an assessment based on market value, it has to be prepared using mass appraisal. It has to be the fee simple estimate of value and it has to reflect typical market conditions. The last one's very, very important because oftentimes a property will sell, it'll sell for 300,000. Uh, the assessor will have it at 310,000. We get questions, well, why isn't it, why isn't it at sale price? Why, why is it $10,000 high? And ultimately it's because we're using all the sales for a stratification of property and we're building a valuation model to reflect what's typical. So oftentimes you're gonna have half of the indicators above the assessment, half the indicators below the assessment. Oh, so just before we get into the market change, so there's, there's three approaches to value uh, that assessor would use when preparing an assessment. So the first, um, you can just, you can go to the, the next slide, yeah. I'll try. So the first is, is the cost approach. So this is typically used for properties that don't trade in the marketplace that often. So um, for example, the, the polyform plant uh, in the industrial park 100,000 square foot industrial uh, manufacturing shop. 
typically you don't have a lot of comparables at that exchange in the marketplace. So the cost approach would be the, uh, the most common approach for something like that. Uh, sales comparison approach, this is the most common approach. So for any single detached dwellings, any residential condominiums, essentially we're using the sales of similar properties to establish or estimate the value of, of other uh, residential properties. And then the last is the income approach. So you typically see this with uh, multifamily properties or what we would call ICI properties, so industrial, commercial, investment type properties. So um, the McDonald's, the Tim Hortons, any, anything that typically would, would uh, generate income, the real estate income, we would capitalize that into, into value. So the cost approach is, is very straightforward. Essentially, you're just adding the depreciated cost of improvements to the underlying land value to produce an estimate of value. As I mentioned, you typically only use this in uh, a small amount of properties in the municipality, um, just for properties that don't typically exchange. Sales comparison approach, I won't, I won't go into too much depth here. Again, just using sales of similar properties to estimate the value of, of other uh, similar properties. It's, it's the most common approach that we would use. And then lastly, again, the income approach, um, a capitalization of, uh, of the uh, net operating income into value. So now that the, uh, we've gone over the introduction to assessment, typ typically I don't go into that too, too often, but since it's a new council, it's, it's always nice to have a, a quick refresher. Um, for, for the assessment role this year, for the 2022 tax year, with respect to market change, uh, I want to go to the year-over-year -year difference from the previous assessment role. And when, when I reference market change, what I'm, what I'm referencing is the difference in market conditions since the previous um, evaluation date. So last year's uh, assessment role had a valuation date of uh, July 1st, 2020. This year's will be July 1st, 2021. So we're looking at the difference in market conditions over that one year period. And in market conditions, um, a lot of people will, will, will say, well, why doesn't every property increase or decrease at the same rate? And the thing to note about real estate is that depending on certain locations or certain physical characteristics, um, real estate can often increase or decrease at different rates. And that's why you see oftentimes property assessments uh, for different homes having uh, year over year changes that are, that are different. So here, this is a graph of the, uh, of the market change here for uh, taxable residential properties in, in the town of Coaldale. So it does reflect a normal distribution. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, the number of residential accounts. Uh, on the bottom, uh, the x-axis, you'll see essentially percent change ranges. And I think the, the, the most important thing to focus on here is, is that center bar, where you have roughly 1,700 parcels that are going to be um, changing by way of its uh, market change uh, in that zero to, to, to 1% essentially. So the majority of properties uh, in the town of Coldale will experience a year over year change, if nothing obviously has happened uh, with its physical characteristics uh, of about a percent, between zero and 1%. Uh, and overall the residential uh, assessment basis is up 0.6% this year. Moving on to the next side, essentially it's the same graph, but we're looking at the non-residential market change. So this is the year-over-year -year taxable change in a uh, non-residential assessment. I think the, the main takeaway on this one is that the overall non-residential is up 1.9%. Uh, You'll see that middle graph there. Uh, the majority of properties are going to be uh, slightly uh, lower than, than the, where they were uh, last year. Um, that, that's, the majority of those are going to be on the industrial side of things, where on the right hand of the graph, um, the, the, the commercial properties and, and vacant commercial uh, land is actually up uh, a little bit more than, than, than the industrial. Now shifting gears to the assessment growth. Uh, in, in the residential uh, category, there was about $8.1 million of assessment growth this year. So as a percentage of the previous assessment base, that's about 0.9%. Um, usually uh, when I give these presentations, I, I would say it's, it's typically in that 1% for municipalities, both in residential and non-residential. So uh, as you can see here, the residential is probably fairly typical for, for, uh, uh, for what you would expect year over year. Uh, the non-residential, however, was, was quite a bit uh, larger, uh, 7.8 million in, in assessment growth, which represented 6.2%. So just to give you an idea of, 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 of what that is, to put the, the few pictures to, to the numbers. So the residential growth, uh, really nothing too shocking here, but uh, it just basically single uh, detached dwellings was the large 
uh, contributor to to the to the assessment growth there. So uh, new houses coming from the Cottonwood area and, and the Parkside area. On the non-residential uh, side, uh, of course, on the top left there, we have the uh, the windows and and, and doors. Um, new industrial uh, manufacturing warehouse on 11th Avenue. Uh, we did have the uh, the addition of the Owls Nest Campground uh, towards the end of the year, um, and and. The addition or the, the, the remainder basically comes from, from the industrial. It's a very strong industrial growth on the non-residential side. And with that, I'll open the floor up to, uh, to any questions. Thank you, Lance. Any questions? I have um, a couple. So can you explain the difference between assessed value of a residential house compared to an appraised value? Well, the assessed value and, and the appraised value, they're both market value, but the biggest difference is the valuation date. So if you were to get a, an appraisal value on your home today, typically the appraiser would value it in today's market conditions. So he would use sales uh, you know, three, three months prior to today's date uh, in, in estimating a, a market value of your home. Uh, whereas your assessment is, is more of a historical value. We're looking at uh, essentially market conditions quite a few months ago, middle of, of July 2021. So the difference between that market and today's market, uh, by my estimates, is, is roughly about 8%. So when you get your assessment notice um, in a few weeks, uh, essentially, or I guess a couple months, uh, essentially, the value of that, the, the assessed value of your property um, is going to be lower than what you could, you could get in the marketplace just because of the market conditions now versus the assessment date. Okay. And one other question I got for doing the assessment, uh, how often do you actually attend the residence? So we're on a five-year reinspection plan. So we do about 20% uh, reviews or property reviews per year. Uh, in the town so once every five years is, is best practices and do you go inside the home lately no historically yes and uh, even before covid uh, oftentimes no we don't um, but we do get around that by way of having folks submit interior photos or uh, phone conversations or, or door conversations we've essentially come to the point i think where people are uneasy with having someone in their house and I think it's the safety for both parties. Um, you know, if there's only one assessor on site and, uh, you know, there's only one person at home and, and we're knocking on the doors. I'll say things have changed in the last 20 years since I started assessment because I used to go out, knock on the door, go through the house with the homeowner. And um, that's just not common practice in today's. So day. the old myth about leaving your baseboard off downstairs so your house can't be assessed properly? No, that's that. That is quite the myth. Um, don't don't take your baseboards off. It's it's okay. not going to do a significant amount of of uh, tax reduction. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Reese? Mayor Van Ryan, uh, through to the chair. I just have a question. How come um, the machine and equipment are exempt here in Coldell? It's it's exempt through bylaw by council. Okay. So there there are places so um our friends down the road town of Tabor, they they tax it but it's it's completely up to council okay yep. councillor chapman i did have a, a question on m e as well although uh i uh i was just wondering on m e if the uh if farm equipment was uh in under normal practices would be included or excluded Farm equipment, um, do you have an example? Like you mean a combine or something like that? Uh, I suppose some of that or any type of, uh, for example, if they have um, uh, manufacturing, I think, item uh, shop, I believe, at their, at their location or if they're doing uh, uh, commercial work on their farm if that M&E would be applied. So if, yeah, so if any improvement that's used in, in processing or manufacturing, um, that would qualify for an improvement and that's integral to, to the manufacturing or process, then yes, it, it would qualify and be assessed as machinery okay. equipment. But that doesn't include like, when we talk about equipment in, in the normal uh, language, it, we think combine or 
we, we don't assess vehicles, we don't assess forklifts, that type of thing. So anything that's, that's essentially uh, of great heft or attached to a structure that's used in that process, then yes, yes we would. Okay, thank you. Uh, my final question is with regarding to uh, a, more of a political question and what I'd heard, uh, understood from uh, presentations even at Mayors and Reeves is that there is an indication by us, uh, uh, other jurisdictions outside of, the, outside of Coaldale, so for example in the counties and, and that particularly, uh, that um, assessment is being driven down so that the property tax could uh, be lowered as well, but that that emphasis would be driven by government rather than by the economy. So would you have a, a comment on that? Yes, that, that would be 100% false. Okay. <laughs> as, as a third party uh, assessment firm, um, we, we prepare values based on market. And we're audited every year, stage one, stage two, sometimes stage three, okay. uh, by the uh, by the Alberta Municipal Affairs, uh, and it is purely based on on um, market value for for market value properties. So um, we we don't have municipalities um, trying to lean on us to to drive down values for any uh, any sort of agenda. We're 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 free to to assess uh, as we interpret the market. Thank you. I just felt that, that it could affect, you know, our local, you know, uh, assessment values as well if that, that suppression of, of, uh, of value was driven down, but I, I'm hearing the opposite then. My final, uh, I just have one more final question with regarding to the, the new um, LGFF or the local government funding formula that the uh, province will be instituting in 24. Uh, do you have any comments with regards to how that uh, funding formula will, will work on assessment? Um, nothing to update council with at this time, no. Okay, thank you. No. Okay, thank you. Once more around the table, any further questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you very much, Lance. Thank you. And Kyle, you're pretty quiet up there tonight, Kyle. But... Okay. Thank you. Can I get someone to uh, make a motion that council accept the property tax assessment report as information? Councillor Pickering, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we're going to back up to item 4.1, the uh, skate park working group terms of reference. Uh, Melanie Messier, our planner, is going to be presenting. Melanie, the floor is yours. And council um, this report is to present council with the draft terms of reference for the skate park working group um, as of today the working group has met twice uh, first to review the terms of reference and second to evaluate different site locations for a new or revitalized skate park um, so one of the key documents that have been created by this uh, working group is the terms of reference um, and the terms of reference essentially uh, um, identifies or lays out uh, the working group's scope and goals uh, for the term of uh, the year. Um, so the first item that they will be evaluating or already have evaluated is potential site locations and potential advantages and disadvantages with each location. They will also be looking at desirable features for a new or revitalized skate park once a location has been identified. Uh, they'll be providing preliminary design options on that location and they will be providing valuable insight on future skateboard programming, um, enhanced partnerships within the community um, and broader engagement with the community once we have more of an idea of a set location. Uh, the working group has worked with staff collaboratively to develop a vision for the working group which is pictured up there. So. Whether new or revitalized, Coaldale Skate Park is a thoughtfully designed amenity that considers a growing population and serves a variety of levels of experiences and ages while creating an innovative, accessible, and fun space for youth, parents, and citizens to gather and play. So currently there is no budget assigned to the skateboard project um, or skateboard, uh, new skate park uh, project, 
but as part of one of the objectives for the working group, they are going to be evaluating and seeking uh, funding opportunities as well as some funding options to come back to council to present. Um, uh, council has already approved a public participation plan with the larger community. However, once um, the group has determined how they would like to engage with the larger community, um, if the public participation plan needs to be amended, then we will bring it back to council for their review. Um, so with that, council may wish to um, select one of the following options, that council accepts the skate park working group, term, park working group terms of references, in terms of references information, uh, that they accept the working group or the terms of reference with amendments, or that they provide alternative direction to staff. Thanks, Mel. Any questions for Mel? I just have one. Oh, sorry, Councilor Reese, go ahead. You're good. Okay, I just have one question. So as far as the public participation on, on the document that was part of the, the staff report, um, step four, the conceptual design review, and then step five is when um, uh, council and community presentation and next steps is d discussed. Are we going to have public input as part of the design or are we going to design it and then ask the public for comments after? Um, looking back at the mountain bike park approach, uh, we did have the working group members take the lead on providing the design and working directly with the consultant. Uh, given that they're the real experts in these areas, we would want to put it in the working group's hands and then go to the community and have opportunities for them to provide feedback. However, really lean on the working group as the drivers of that conceptual plan. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments? Councillor Chapman. Mayor Van Ryan, uh, just through to Melanie, thank you again. The uh, makeup of the group, are you at full capacity now? No, we can take on new members. Uh, we have a variety of adults, um, youth on it as well, um, but we're open to new members. And do you need it? Is that uh, determined through council then, uh, the makeup of that board, that committee and the members? So for the expression of interest, it was passed by council that all who applied um, were accepted into the group. Uh, two of the members um, dropped out, uh, so there is room for more and we can bring it back to council for approval. Yeah, thank you for reminding me about that. Uh, if you need to have a motion to do that, uh, by all means, so we can do that at a later time, I would, I suppose, or if we want to do that now. Are you wanting to join? Is that well? I mean, if you need more members, we'd be happy to to support you with that. If you need, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're asking for council members as as defined, but if you're looking for more public participation, um, maybe that <clears> should be determined through a motion. Councilor Chapman, I'm currently the oldest skateboarder on that committee. <laughs> <laughs> So um, if you want to join the committee, we can do that through email. So I believe uh, Councillor Reese wanted to make the motion. Is that what you're motioning uh, yeah. for? Okay, so that council accepts the skate park working group terms of reference as information? Yep. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Okay, moving ahead to Agenda item 7.1, the Area Structure Plan Bylaw 844-P-03-22, West Industrial Area Structure Plan, first reading. Cameron Mills, our Director of Growth and Investment, is going to be presenting. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you very much, Mayor Van Ryan. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to Council this evening. This or Okay, 
and I'll just let you know. So, um, so for council's consideration, I've provide, put together a, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation to help us guide uh, some of the discussion here. What we have here today is, uh, I think, an exciting thing uh, for the community, uh, something I think we've talked about as a group uh, at a high level. And uh, what we're doing here tonight is first reading of uh, what's known as bylaw 844-P-03-22, which from now on I'm simply going to call the West Industrial Area um, What we have uh, here really for presented for council is first reading and it's 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 first reading of a, of a bylaw but also an attached area structure plan that was presented or prepared uh, by ISL engineering on behalf of 845 developments which is uh, the principal landowner within the quarter section there are a number of landowners within the quarter section uh, but they represent the largest uh, stake in this particular so what I want to pro provide, uh, given that you know uh, we, we do have some councillors for which this will be the first area structure plan that we're considering as a group, uh, provide a little bit of a background in terms of what it is uh, we're actually doing, and maybe uh, perhaps allay some some fears or concerns with respect to uh, you know how much of the process we're actually taking on this evening. Uh, so we'll talk about the purpose of an area structure plan. Uh, do uh, a little bit uh, of some of the uh, information with respect to it and then kind of kind of move on to some other discussion so uh, Lana if you may so first of all the purpose of an area structure plan uh, the municipal government act which guides uh, all of the municipal decision making uh, that we undertake has uh, specific sections which with respect to planning and in fact discusses uh, area structure plans uh, specifically and they, they talk about area structure plans as a statutory plan for the purpose of providing a framework for subsequent subdivision and development of an area of land. Uh, what must be included in an area structure plan is the sequence of development for proposed area uh, at, a, at a general level, at a high level. The, again, at a high level, the land use is proposed for the area, uh, either generally or with respect to specific parts. Density of population is not a particularly uh, serious concern with respect to an area, uh, an area structure plan for an industrial development and can contain other matters including matters relating to uh, reserves uh, or servicing uh, that council deems uh, to be necessary. Mike. And so when we consider the area structure plan process, uh, what the area structure plan ultimately is, is it's adopted by bylaw. Uh, by council and so it requires three readings it requires a uh, public hearing which we undertake after first reading but but prior to considering a second and third reading of that bylaw and that allows for uh, consideration of the plan potentially uh, amendments and changes as we move through that reading process so what you see before you at first reading does not need to ultimately be uh, what is passed as third reading even if it is passed in this format first reading uh, obviously if we're going to take a change in direction then then we may want to consider that but if we're talking about needing to make adjustments down the line we have the opportunity to do so through the reading process um, with respect to how we get from talking about an area structure plan to seeing actual like a building going up for example roads and everything else are in there uh, we approve the area structure plan and then we go into the provision of detailed servicing plans. So, so one of the things we talk about, if you had an opportunity to read uh, the, the plan prepared in detail, talk about an outline plan, we talk about things like traffic impact assessments, assessment studies that you know do the actual calculations for the water servicing and the sewer and things like that. Those are all things that we're going to take a look at as part of the next step of the process, which is the outline plan process. And there is submission of a rezoning application where we actually change the land use, the current land use is urban reserve. We change that to what's appropriate based on the plan. That's also a bylaw that also requires a uh, public hearing and three readings. And then we have submission of a subdivision application which is taken to the Municipal Planning Commission. So that's where the actual lots that are going to be created are identified and that's where another level of detail is considered. Uh, there are conditions associated with a subdivision approval. The subdivision will say conditions everything from making sure the taxes are paid so that you know when it transfers land you know you're not you know, tax bill uh, to a very common uh, subdivision condition is going to be that the developer is required to enter into a development agreement. The development agreement has uh, all sorts of uh, important items in it includes for the provision of exactly how the infrastructure is going to be built, who pays for what, uh, the timing of things, the requirements for 
bonding to make sure that if something is not done properly, there's an insurance policy is not left on the hook, minimizing the municipality's risk, uh, that sort of thing. And then the fifth stage is, of course, the development permit process, where someone within an existing lot that's now then been created has the opportunity to provide for an application to say, I want the building to look like this, the stormwater management on the lot is going to look like this, here's where I'm going to tie in the services. So when we're looking at it from a really lot-specific basis. So there's a lot of steps involved in getting in what we're talking about today, down to that final process where you see a, a new building. What we're actually proposing here is a little bit different than the way we've done it in the past. Um, and, and it's done this way uh, for a few reasons. We're actually talking uh, this evening about uh, both first reading of step one and step three, uh, which is the rezoning process. And the reason we're doing that is a few. First of all, uh, it's in, in, in line with our efforts to always be reducing red tape. Um, so we're looking at this and saying, okay, we have an area structure plan which contemplates zoning that's relatively uniform, it's industrial, and where it's not industrial, it's light industrial or highway commercial, which is very similar, and it's rezoning which is likely to take place in the very near term following the area structure plan. So given the fact that we're having these conversations in a public forum and at a public hearing, uh, doing these things in tandem makes sense. We're not suggesting necessarily second and third reading of the rezoning happening um, in the immediate term, but we are suggesting that we can initiate first reading of the rezoning, and then we can go to a public hearing that we can do jointly with the area structure plan because we're going to have an opportunity to talk about the zoning while we're talking about the area structure plan. And one of the things we've found, especially where rezoning applications happen very near to when area structure plan applications happen is that sometimes the general public who don't have the benefit of, of being experts in the process side of planning maybe don't understand the difference between the ASP process and the rezoning. They have their concerns, their concerns are very valid, but they don't necessarily know when it's appropriate to bring up those what we found from time to time, we had this experience a little bit for anyone who was involved in the South uh, Area Structure Plan, the, the Area Structure Plan that was passed uh, for the neighborhood by the Quads, for example, where we passed an Area Structure Plan, and there were some concerns that were raised as part of that Area Structure Plan process, which is not uncommon, and many of those concerns were addressed, but not 100% of people involved in the Area Structure Plan uh, process might maybe were, were perfectly happy with what the decision that was made, uh, perhaps with respect to something like the inclusion of higher density land uses. So we have a public hearing where we discuss that, council considers it, reviews the plan, and on the merits of the plan and considering what they're hearing from the public says, yes, this is appropriate, and they pass the plan. And then six weeks later, we have a public hearing where we're going to rezoning where we say, you know, is, is higher density residential appropriate? We'd really just had these discussions six weeks previous, and so now the public is saying, well, I brought this up, like I'm bringing this issue up, and then council has to look at it and say, yes, I mean, we, we approved the zoning that's being proposed as part of the area pl structure plan six weeks ago. There are no new concerns that are being addressed, and so they're, they're passing it again, and it, it can perhaps, for folks that don't understand the process, create a question of like, well, listening to me again or why are we talking about this again because they're, they don't necessarily have expertise in this. So what we're suggesting here is to say because of the nature of this development it really makes sense to do the two uh, congruently or at the same time and if council doesn't want to go in that direction we're certainly capable of, of holding off on doing it but from our perspective uh, delaying that when you have public hearings and things like that um, there's advertising requirements that go into them, so if we don't do these things congruently and we decide we want to do them at a later date, it does slow down the potential to process. So from our perspective on the balance of the issues, it makes sense to do the two at the same time. Um, Lana, to the next one. So when you look at, again at the purpose of the area structure plan, uh, we have the opportunity for substantially more detailed site design for infrastructure before lots are ready for development, even after the area structure plan is considered. So what this document really is, is at the highest level, what it is we're proposing for the area and the general concepts associated with it. Lana? 
And then again, we have other opportunities to consider some of these details with respect to uh, you know, public meetings, deliberation. We have the MPC, which has the opportunity to consider subdivision, which is publicly held. We have the MPC again potentially involved for some of the more uh, significant uses. So for example, anything that's a discretionary use that's ultimately being built within the plan application. So when we're considering issues like the potential for uh, a use that people aren't comfortable being adjacent to, for example. Uh, we have the opportunity to consider it at a high level at rezoning, and then we have an opportunity to consider it again at a more detailed level uh, at steps that come down the line. Steps are advertised and they are made available. So what we're talking about with respect uh, to the plan, we're looking at the entire quarter section that lies to the west uh, of the northern portion of the existing town of Coaldale Industrial Park. Uh, the area outlined in, in yellow on this map represents the entirety of the plan area. Now there are multiple landowners uh, within this plan area and the proponent 845 Developments uh, owns uh, the large rectangular piece in the center there, about 90 acres uh, of the broader quarter section. Uh, though they are, uh, the, this is some, some, some of the area to the north is owned I believe by one of the uh, um, the areas are all generally uh, zoned urban reserve with the caveat that the live electric site, which is one of the uh, southern sites, the larger of the two southern sites in the southwest uh, corner is zoned light industrial uh, and they're actively running their electric out of that site. The former Bill's electric site, now the live. Uh, this area was annexed into the town back in 2018 during the most recent uh, annexation and even during that time and when you look at the, uh, the town plan, the contemplation is really fundamentally for this type of use. And uh, the lagoon lies directly to the north and uh, station grounds uh, lies uh, to the south and the western half. Uh, So again, with respect to the application, uh, one of the things that, that we do and one of the things I think we take pride in as a municipality is making sure that we engage early and often uh, with the public in developing these plans and it's something that we've been doing a little more aggressively over the last uh, few years, at least probably the wrong term, but with the, to say that we get involved in talking to the public and talking to stakeholders uh, earlier on in the process than simply saying, here's a plan, let's have a public hearing. So. Uh, with respect to that uh, and to align with the town's public participation policy, uh, this developer engaged with ISL Engineering who have a very robust uh, planning component to their business and they engaged in, uh, in developing the ASP and in doing so they engaged in some uh, public consultation that began in December of 2021, ran through uh, January of 2022. They had a virtual open house. Uh, they had an online survey. We didn't have the capacity to do anything in person uh, during this time. And they also had a virtual engagement session and they engaged in direct consultation with some stakeholders, which is to say, partially to say, the other uh, landowners that are involved in the process uh, within the quarter section and also uh, you know, have consultation with some of the, the folks uh, in the area, I believe, specifically included in those conversations. And so what we've asked them to do, and previously we've had uh, public consultation uh, information come in, and then that information is used to inform the design of the plan. And it's embedded in the little bits and pieces in the policies and procedures that are outlined in the plan. And what we're doing here is the first time that we've done it where we're really trying to make it really, really, really clear uh, how the public consultation has informed the plan. So section 3.3, .3, uh, of this document not only outlines where they talk about public consultation they're not only outlines to say here's what we did to talk to the public but what we asked them to do and what they gave us was to say okay well summarize in a, at, a, at a relatively broad level what is it that we heard in the in the consultation process don't just tell me that it informs the document say here's what we heard and also here's how it's addressed either through the planning process or through the town's existing regulations or through some other means. But let's be very, very clear about what we're hearing, what we're doing about it. If there's something we're not addressing that was raised as a concern, that might be reasonable if we feel that the, the, what was raised is not reasonable. But we need to be very, very clear and very straightforward and very transparent with the public to say, yes, we did hear. And this is our approach and this is how we're dealing with it. And so that's laid out in section 3.3 .3 of the plan. Uh, designed to be as clear and transparent and accountable as possible. 
Lana? So what makes up the components of the plan? Fundamentally, uh, seven areas, and we outlined in the staff report, and I won't, I won't read it out uh, word for word, but components of the plan include planning context, which is to say, what are the legislate what is the legislative framework through which the plan was designed talk to me about uh, you know obviously the municipal government act but what else informs the plan well we have the town plan which is a document that outlines how the entirety of the town is supposed to grow and it's a document that we approved after a couple of years of work and a tremendous amount of consultation with the general public that tells us at a high level what are the residents of Coaldale looking for in terms of accommodating uh, growth and change uh, it also considers the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan um, and then more specific plans like our Gateways and Corridors Plan, acknowledging that this area structure plan does lie on Highway 845 and so we want to make sure that the plan incorporates what we've talked about as a community with respect to how we want our major gateways and corridors to look and feel as folks come into our community over the long term. So that is included in their, in their consideration. Uh, the planning area. Really, it's providing context to the space, right? So times, here's where it is. Uh, here's what we know about the land at a high level. Features, topography, that sort of thing. The development concept uh, really starts to get into a little bit more detailed analysis of the proposal. And that's going to th have include things like proposed land uses, high level transportation network. Uh, that sort of thing and again that's where we find that section 3.3 which I think is particularly critical say here's what the public can uh, the development framework is where we start to get into the policies so the plan uh, provides for policies for how the de future development within our go and so for example that includes uh, policies which address some of these concerns so for example we heard in our consultation some folks from station grounds for example saying a little bit concerned about saying well there's an industrial park being proposed next door how is this plan going to address those concerns and so it lays out specific policies so, so policy 4.1.4 addresses landscaping and screening uh, 4.2.6 has a screening requirement uh, an additional screening requirement for development next to or next to industrial uses and 4.4.7 uh, has additional landscaping Allowing the southern boundary of the plan area. So additional landscaping south, acknowledging that. Uh, there are other things in there, for example, the transportation network, so roadways, intersections, uh, pathways, that sort of thing. Now, the area structure plan, again, is a high level document, so the outline plan can provide for some. Uh, change uh, to the roadway network ultimately upon final design, but at a high level, what it really speaks to in the plan area. Uh, is outlined there. Uh, we're looking at a major, uh, um, um, major the major traffic flow being along uh, 12th Avenue within the plan connecting to Highway 845. Likely some inter intersectional upgrades with 845 being included on that. That's all going to be based on the traffic impact assessment that's coming out, um, and just providing for that that sort of general traffic flow. Uh, the ne oh, sorry, and that's part of Section 5, which is the transportation framework. Number six is the servicing framework. Again, that talks about water, wastewater, uh, stormwater management. Where is you know where is the pond going? For example, how's that going to work? Um, that's all outlined there. And then uh, implementation, which is to say, uh, providing for a, a phasing of the project. So, Lana, if you may. So one of the things that's outlined in the plan is a proposal for land use, and so I've taken this uh, this from this map from the plan proposal. Uh, what you see is uh, the vast majority of the plan area being in uh, purple, which is the the areas uh, primarily on the eastern half and 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 the, even the majority of the western half. Which is to say, the proposal there on a land use perspective is for our industry I zoning. Uh, with on the western area, uh, acknowledging that, uh, for example, the uh, to that side we wanted to uh, provide for some uh, flexibility and so that's located on the western side on the highest visibility parts uh, locating next to highway 845 and the proposal there is for a mix of uh, light industry or highway commercial zoning we are considering the rezoning this evening and the the application has come in uh, suggesting uh, the c2 uh, highway commercial zoning in those areas from a intensity of use perspective there's not a huge difference between light industry uh, and highway commercial and so the plan really pro really talks about providing for flexibility to meet 
with respect to that. Um, so the application that's come forward happens to be C2, but if an application to rezone to light industry within that space uh, was received, we'd probably consider it relatively favorable at the administrative level because the plan allows for either one. We've also got a green strip uh, located along the entirety of the west area of the plan area. That is 10 meters wide, uh, which, is, which is not an insignificant amount of space, and that's going to provide for an opportunity for some landscaping. Uh, we're not going to want to see, for example, uh, a complete uh, wall of, of, of trees, for example. We're going to want to have some opportunity for the business. Some visibility to the highway, but the point within the MR is definitely going to be to make sure high-quality landscaping that's done to, for a nice visual appeal. Cameron, just a quick question then, talking about landscaping on the south border where you where you said the uh, station grounds were going to be the neighbors, that Spur Line Avenue, they're going to be backing right onto that industrial park. So is there any anticipation of doing some a green strip there with trees or what have you to block that view? Uh, so there isn't a plan within the plan area for any municipal reserve down there. There's a combination of factors. So the individual lots are going to have a requirement. For and then there's also 14th Avenue. Down there. There's no contemplation on our end to develop 14, 14th Avenue uh, for the use of a transportation corridor. And realistically, uh, you know, we're going to have feedback from Alberta Transportation as part of this process, but they definitely are, their preference is definitely to the amount of intersections along the highway so we have an opportunity to to have some landscaping built in uh, potentially to the roadway if we want to see a, congru a congruent amount of landscaping but alternatively what they are saying is that there, there's going to be a requirement uh, for the individual lots to have that landscape but they'll want to do that on the on the curb side though for curb appeal they won't be doing that on the back though and there will be both so there is going to be a requirement that they do that within those lots uh, as part of the as part of the policies that are outlined. Okay, thank you. Just a general note within the plan area, the rough calculation here is about 115 acres of industrial lot, about 20 acres of the light industrial or commercial, and about 12 areas of open space, which is to say the, the green. So that doesn't include the stormwater pond, that does include potentially some greenery around the stormwater pond, and then also that 10 meter buffer on the side. Any, they do, of course, owe the, the standard 10% uh, municipal reserve. Uh, so if it does come in less than that, there would be a cash contribution paid. So while you have that stormwater uh, slide up, is that going to be built to size the full build out or is it only going to do it in phases? So the area accommodates for uh, the full build out. How they, whether they build it out uh, only to accommodate the first 90 acres or not, um, from our perspective, as long as they meet the requirements uh, within the construction, they'll be fine. But of course, it needs to work uh, properly. And I think, realistically speaking, from a cost benefit perspective, there's probably it's probably cheaper just to do it once. Uh, and that'll be just for the current uh, investors. There, there package or for all the future landowners yeah, as well? Yeah, so there is a bit of a, a cost sharing uh, potential. There's additional cost associated with that. Uh, there's going to be endeavors to assist uh, for the development of the additional uh, lot. So if they're tying in, so for example, if the, the lot to the far north benefits uh, from some portion of that uh, stormwater pond, in order for them to go through the process of creating those lots, if their stormwater is connecting there, they're going to owe person that fronted the money okay and then that stormwater pond that's connected to the one on the other side of 13th street the existing one the water from that after a rain event flows into the cheese factory drain then i believe so yeah so the cheese factory drain like that is quite small as it stands now and the birds of prey drains into that as well mm -hmm. so if we have issues with that in the future that'll come out of the off-site levy portion of it then or yeah, and again, the the final design from an engineering perspective, a lot of this stuff there, the the engineers are still going to require finalization of these designs. So that's gonna that's gonna provide for some opportunity to have, uh, you know, these specific conversations. And if there's uh, significant uh, infrastructure uh, improvements that need to be done, we'll be able to understand uh, where that's coming from. If it's coming from the offsite levies, or if there's contributions that need to be made towards that sort of thing. Uh, but from our perspective. 
at a high level, uh, this makes sense. It's a, the question of the details uh, comes out as, pro, as part of that outline plan process and, and future process. Okay, thank you. So when you consider phasing here, uh, they have provided a phasing plan, and of course they have an opportunity once they start moving forward with it to either uh, combine phases or to uh, or to alter it a little. But this is a this is an example of uh, of what they're looking at from a phasing perspective. So phase one comes in uh, on the east end, though I would suggest that that would include uh, full construction of 12th uh, connecting the highway across, uh, even though that you know phase two is really where it'll be found. Uh, simply to ensure that that connectivity is in place. Um, phase three uh, in the center, and then phase 4A and 4B being located on the southern and northern portions, which represent uh, the alternative. Um, there are, with this design, there are a few, uh, there are three cul-de-sacs located in this design, and that's an issue that, uh, for us, this is a matter of uh, ensuring uh, that we have the, oper well, the, the, the cul-de-sacs to the north are about uh, you know, access to the commercial lot on the west side and about ensuring that we're not creating something where uh, the town necessarily needs to engage uh, in the improvement of uh, the township road to the north, which is the road upon which uh, the transfer station is occurring. So within this design, it's entirely possible that these cul-de-sacs uh, become uh, intersection points down the line when we start looking again at some of that more detailed design. Um, but we're providing for the opportunity for it to be either or at our discretion uh, once we have some more of that data in place. To the south, uh, the cul-de-sac there uh, is partially an accommodation uh, to the southern southeastern landowner who's giving up uh, the potential corner lot access uh, for their existing parcel onto the town's uh, existing road, uh, which is an appealing thing uh, for an industrial development given that that uh, landowner is giving up a substantial portion of their land for the stormwater and so this gives them the opportunity to do that on the west side and then that also ties in the larger uh, live electric piece to provide them with an opportunity uh, to connect uh, on the eastern side of their lot. Again, the purpose, uh, the, the plan for that is not to ultimately connect it to uh, 14th Avenue. Actually ever, but So we've already circulated this plan uh, to gain some feedback. So Lethbridge County, we have an intermunicipal development plan that does call for 30 days uh, to Terry. So we have provided them with an opportunity to provide some feedback on this, given that it is adjacent uh, to the county, which lies to the west uh, of the plan area. We've also circulated uh, the plan to Alberta Transportation. Now, Alberta Transportation has been engaged at this point. Uh, with some discussion of the traffic impact assessment throughout the process, but they have the opportunity to provide formal comments. And uh, we've also circulated internally. So we've circulated the document to our internal departments, which is to say uh, fire and emergency, uh, public works, uh, so operations, uh, the engineering department, though they've been in directly in the plan review, uh, finance department, what have you, and just make sure that uh, from an organizational perspective, if there's concerns associated with the plan design, they have an opportunity to provide that feedback. And we'll have all of that uh, back in advance of the potential public hearing, which we're So following first reading of the bylaw, uh, what we're proposing is a public hearing time and date to be established and a hearing to be held to consider additional input from interested parties public. And upon completion of the public hearing, council will then have the opportunity to consider the bylaw uh, as presented or request alterations or amendments in advance of uh, potentially providing second and third reading at that meeting or at a future meeting. And council might also uh, elect to decline to approve the bylaw following the And with that, uh, our recommendation is that council provide uh, first reading of area structure plan bylaw 844-P-03-22 and set the public hearing date and time for April 25th. On that note, if I may, uh, before we open up to questions, the other issue uh, that we would love uh, to have Council's impact or uh, input on is uh, naming of the area. So we've discussed uh, certainly with the developer that um, we call it the West Industrial Area Structure Plan for the purpose of remembering where it is. Uh, but we don't need to call the industrial park the West Coaldale Industrial Park uh, long term. And in fact, the developer has expressed interest uh, in uh, coming up with a name that's reflective of the community 
actually honoring a community member or reflective of value, uh, and they'd love to have some input on what that might ultimately be. And I would suggest that uh, what might make sense is to adopt a name that incorporate that we incorporate that name for the entirety of the industrial area, and then the developer, as part of the development agreement, would be providing signage. If you think about, for example, Roxburgh Industrial Park sign at its entrance point. That would be something the developer would look to provide at their entrance, and we could, for example, match that on 8th Street as providing access to the north. Uh, but that being said, um, we would love to have uh, Council's consideration on that. If Council has some ideas on what a good industrial park name might be, we'd... Uh, we'd so just to confirm, a name for the entire industrial park or split it into two or...? Entirely up, up to you. Um, I, I think it... Personally, I think it makes sense to provide it as a single unit, but that being said, we can recognize the fact that it is um, ownership is not, not an, long term, uh, you know, the developers never own anything long term. That's the, that's the opposite of the point. At the end of the day, it will all be one congruent industrial area. So uh, from a marketing perspective, it's nice to have some branding associated with it to call it something other than worked pretty well so far, but um, it's just an opportunity for us to consider that. So the developer is certainly not uh, not interested in combining the two. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Cameron? Councillor Reese. Thank you, Mayor Ryan, through to Cam. Um, I like the idea of approval for step one and two, so, so that you don't, later on, we don't have to go through that whole process again. I like that idea. I was just wanting some clarification about the green strip behind station grounds or the possible possibility of a something because those residents are not going to be happy to have an industrial park right behind them. Right. Um, thank you, Councillor. So it's certainly uh, something that, that could be considered. Again, there is, there is a, there's a difference between uh, a green strip as a functional piece versus uh, green strip as municipal reserve. So, for example, again, the town does own a road right of way that could is could be a green strip as much as it could be a road. If we want to convert uh, the use of that road to providing for uh, that type of thing, we could. If we if we would prefer to say no, we want to leave the opportunity to potentially develop the road there uh, down the line, then we could come back to the developer and say amend the plan to provide for. Um, for example, a 10 meter buffer along the south edge of the property, uh, leaving that uh, roadway in place yeah. as is currently. Well, with that being said, though, I thought that there was only going to be a couple of entrances going forward into the industrial park anyways, mm -hmm. so that road may not be needed anyways. Thank you. I I'm of the opinion that it's very unlikely, given the layout of station grounds, that developing 14th Mm -hmm. necessarily makes a ton of sense for the community. I'm not an expert on the infrastructure, so I, I definitely want the engineers to comment on that. But um, if the if 14th is is not to be developed as a roadway, uh, planting uh, planting program in in that place is a perfectly reasonable use of the space. Thank you. And station grounds, they have a, a couple of access points into their area off 14th there, okay. so. We have to take that into account as well. Sure. Councillor Chapman. Questions out of my mouth, that's great. I wanted to ask you, Cam, if um, the streets, that might be getting into the weeds here a little bit, but um, I'm just really concerned that we don't uh, have the is same issues we had years before and to ensure that we have wide enough streets uh, and avenues uh, in that industrial park. Uh, to accommodate uh, large truck uh, truck traffic to go through there. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the the main like Twelfth Avenue is being designed uh, using the uh, collector uh, standard, and then the other uh, side streets are are being proposed at the local uh, road standard. But again, still meeting those uh, typical road uh, size. Of, I believe we we still we use the City of Lethbridge standard for that. So. Um, I don't foresee. I, d I don't personally foresee any concerns with respect to the, the size of the roads. Any further questions, Council Reese? Um, I've got one more question. Um, is it possible that we have some time to think of some names for this area? 
Thank you, Councillor Reese. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the potential of the public hearing date we're proposing is April 25th. Okay. Um, that would be the earliest possible opportunity to consider those names. And we can certainly consider them afterwards. There's no, we can always change it down the line. Uh, okay. It doesn't really need to be associated with the area structure plan. It's really more of a marketing exercise anyway. Sure. But uh, yeah, we certainly want to make sure that we take the time to think of the, the right choice. Yeah. Absolutely. Councillor Chapman. Happy to make the motion to give first reading uh, to the bylaw and set the uh, public hearing date for April 25th at 5:30. Okay, thank you. And I just have before we call a question on that, on the bylaw it refers to as the Prairie Crossing Area Structure Plan. Well, Can you comment on that? I made it on the actual bylaw. I used the Prairie Crossing Area Structure Plan as the Okay. base of the bylaw so I didn't where, whereabouts uh, may I ask does that's it that's just above the signature lines well I will let's amend that maybe that would... it's item one yeah, page 40 I changed the one in the first part of the sentence but not the okay any further questions comments so I'm look or Councillor Chapman uh, sponsored that motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you, Cameron. Don't run away. You're still up. Moving on to item 7.2, the rezoning land use bylaw 845-P-03-22 West Industrial Area Structure Plan first reading. Cameron. Thank you, Mayor Van Ryn. Um, ditto. <laughs> so, this is this is the the next bylaw, and it's exactly it's exactly what we discussed. So, it is the industrial um, area structure plan rezoning bylaw. Uh, it is specific to the uh, ninety uh, acre piece in the center, so it doesn't call for uh, the rezoning of the properties owned by other landowners. Uh, it really is with respect to uh, those I those identified as phases one, two, and three uh, within the plan area. So really what we're suggesting here is having a conversation about land use at the same time as having a conversation about the area structure plan because they really are very closely linked. Um, while we may suggest consideration of second and third reading of the area structure plan at the same meeting, we may not suggest second and third reading of rezoning because we probably will want to um, align uh, the rezoning uh, more once the outline plan is complete to know, okay, maybe the highway commercial lots are actually five feet narrower. Um, what will have a better sense of that once the outline plan uh, things are complete. Um, but we can make those amendments uh, down the line. We have two years from the, as I understand, in Lana is far more of an expert in this than I am, but we have about two years from the first reading uh, to complete second and third reading. So we're, what we're suggesting, though, is to say, because we're looking at this as being you know, strategically important for the town, we have a, uh, some more uh, industrial land line. We don't want uh, the potential to need to do a, a minor uh, amendment to you know, require an extra 30 days, given that our construction window is relatively short. So it makes sense to consider the two items at the same time from a public hearing perspective. And then potentially a month or so down the line, we would come back with rezoning whenever has all of that information in place. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Cameron regarding this rezoning? Seeing none, could I get someone to sponsor a motion that council provide first reading of land use bylaw amendment 845-P-03-22 and set the public hearing date and the time is April 25th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Councillor Beekman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you. Moving on to item 9.1, financial update, December 31st, 2021. Our CFO, uh, Kyle Bouchamp, will be presenting. Okay, thanks and good evening again, Council. So part of this presentation, we have the December 31st, 2021 
uh, essentially quarter four financial update. So kind of give you a little background. Um, the financial statements for the town of Colio are currently being audited by a Vail CPA. Those financial statements will be ready for council's review and approval in April. What we're doing today is that for the year end, as noted in the staff report, we do have an unrestricted surplus of $704,534. Should council want to allocate those funds to a specific project or a specific future reserve, we have to essentially make an adjustment before those financial audited financial statements are approved. So as of today, uh, speaking to the auditors, nothing on here, these figures has changed and I don't expect it to change any further. So what we've kind of talked about in the past with the recreation center and the uh, increasing costs associated with that and the servicing of that, we've taken the approach for 2021 of looking at the, the surplus for this past year from an operational perspective and allocating that to this project to kind of help complete the funding model for that. So with that in mind, that is what administration has done in these draft financial statements is allocate that surplus to that project. However, council does have their, has at their discretion to um, allocate this as they wish and to change that. So uh, kind of two parts here. We do have draft financial statements as part of the quarterly updates. I don't have a full variance variance analysis just because that's going to be part of the when we do the audit the financial statement presentation but I'd be happy to answer any questions that council may have at this moment and then the second par part is if council um, agrees with allocating the as we have noted in the staff reports here uh, with that being said I'll just kind of turn it back to council and um, ask, answer any questions they may have on this okay thank you any questions for Kyle I have one, Kyle. Just regarding the, um, uh, just back up here, the 238785 that you want to put towards the Northwest Coaldale infrastructure, that is part of the uh, water rights sale? That's where that money comes from? So that money is part of the, the 704000 The water rights sale will all be recognized next year for, sorry, this year for 20, well, I guess next year for 2022. Okay. So what we've done for the water rights temporarily is allocate a portion of it um, to that infrastructure cost to essentially fund what we think the end project will be. And then the balance we've kind of kicked over to the rec center. At 14000 and something. Yep. Okay, so just so I got it clear then, it's 238 that we're, we're borrowing the money from the water rights sale then. Not particularly. So that the 238 is what we spent for 2021. That's over and above yes. the previous previously approved budget. So that comes out of that. the The 704 doesn't include any part of the water rights. Okay. Yeah. So that's on top of the 704. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, that's easy then. Seeing none, our, our uh, options are council can allocate the 2021 surplus as recommended by administration, or council can request further information before allocating the 2021 surplus. I'll open it up to the floor. Councillor Reese. Thank you, Mayor. And, um, I'd like to make a motion that council allocate the 238785 to the Northwest Coaldale Infrastructure Capital and the 465749 allocated towards the Multi-Use Rec Center, or, yeah, Capital Reserve. So would you make a friendly amendment that we just uh, allocate the 2021 surplus as recommended by administration to those two that you just mentioned? Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aired unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 9.2, planning and community development, departmental 2021 year in review, Cameron Mills presenting. 
fine. It's good to be back. <laughs> yeah. Section here. So, um, What I've prepared today is uh, one of uh, four reports that our department is going to be providing to council as sort of a, a quarterly uh, update, which I understand all the departments are engaging in. Um, for our department, we have the opportunity to speak to council quite regularly, uh, so I think council is generally aware uh, from a planning and development perspective what it is that we're up to on a day-to-day -day basis. But what, what we've broken down uh, the quarterly reports for provide a little outline here and this will be the Q1 report so what we're providing here is the 2021 year in review from a development per, uh, statistics perspective and uh, so this is something that's going to look at the entirety of the 2021 year uh, from a development perspective in terms of how Coaldale did and, and saw what we're proposing is that in the uh, June report we're going to do a sort of a more of a major project uh, update with respect to some of how some of the the plans are going and, and some of the major construction uh, from a planning and development perspective that's occurring. And then in the quarter three, which will be September, we're going to do uh, the first half of 2022. So a similar report to this one, but looking at January uh, through the end of June uh, from a development perspective. So that gives council the opportunity to see the development that's occurring and review the development stats uh, twice annually looking at uh, larger chunks of time and then uh, we're going to look at the 2022 comparative analysis in the q4 report so we haven't done the 2021 comparative analysis yet that's typically something that we do right around christmas time and that's something that we've done uh we've done two of so far we're the first municipality to start doing this type of reporting and it's it's basically a financial report but it's a, a report that's done uh, outside of of kyle's department and really what it is is taking a look at the town of Coaldale in terms of its operation, in terms of its revenues and its expenses and a number of other factors that we've found have been uh, items that are of interest to the general public and we say how is Coaldale doing and how do we compare to other municipalities with respect to that. So uh, for example, how much do we spend on staffing and then how much do other municipalities spend on staffing. I try to provide a frame of reference uh, for people because I think it can be difficult to understand uh, whether the town, you know, when you look at what the town spends, was that a high number or a low number? Well, what's typical? And so it's just a different way for municipality to look at its operations, something we're very proud of. And it's something that for 2022, I'm actually going to try to have uh, in April is not as part of a development report uh, now that council has had an opportunity to spend a couple months uh, in the role and, and get a sense of uh, what the municipality is all about. Uh, what we have today, though, is uh, the planning and development uh, Q1 report. And uh, Lana, if you can just uh, scroll down to that portion. I've also provided as a part of this report and as an attachment uh, what fundamentally amounts to a, uh, a report from our communications department. So we had uh, Leah Cathro as our communications officer uh, who since uh, left the organization to pursue an opportunity in Canmore. Um, and council is engaging in some consultation, as I understand it, to provide for uh, a new, uh, an updated communication strategy. And so uh, the report that's included, and I won't speak to it, uh, in any sort of detail, but that provides uh, council with an understanding of you know how much are we communicating, how many Facebook posts are we making, press releases, all that sort of information, as well as uh, dissecting some of our engagement. We will report on communications uh, once we have our, our new uh, communications person in place, as well as a new uh, formula for how the town is going about it. And we'll prevent, we'll provide for some communications reporting uh, based on our new strategy and structure down the line, but see what that strategy is before we figure out what that's going to look like. Uh, looking at the development side of the ledger, so provided uh, for this uh, this report, now that's a little, uh, any any possible way to zoom in on that? Or it is uh, definitely a, uh, it's definitely a, a small screen. So this is a lot of information, obviously. A lot of interesting takeaways from this. So this is, from a development permit perspective, uh, all the statistics from the development permit process uh, from 2021. And there are some things that stand out here. Um, on the far right column, you see t monthly total permits. And, and I just, uh, I want to take an opportunity to speak to this a little bit. We did 171 uh, development ter permits in 2021. Um, that represents a little bit over a 25% increase in terms of permit volumes uh, from what we did in 2020. 
Uh, the value of those permits at 97 million is up from about 10 million uh, in 2020. Uh, so it's a, about a tenfold increase. Now there's some reasons for that. Um, what I want to speak to, though, first of all, is to say that we did 25% uh, more development permits. And looking at an individual development permit from a workload perspective, uh, development permit for a shed is a lot less work than a development permit for the New Bethel Windows building. So not only did we do 25% more development permits, but we also did more substantial development permits, and that's reflected in the values of those permits. And we did it at a time uh, where we had a significant amount of staff turnover, uh, Kylie uh, going on maternity leave and other sort of hiccups like that. And I just want to take this opportunity to point out that uh, the, particularly the work done by uh, Melanie Messier within our department to accommodate uh, that volume was really spectacular. And so I just want to have the opportunity to say that on record that I'm very, very grateful uh, for her really taking the ball and running with it on that front because she does the uh, the vast majority. I, I have the opportunity to review and sign off on Mel's work uh, periodically, uh, but she really does uh, take on the, the so it's She's really good wonderful. at making you look good. She, she does a wonderful job. And actually, to that point, uh, we've also incorporated Jason Siemens from the engineering department into some of these reviews as well. And having his engineering expertise in these reviews has been uh, absolutely wonderful for us as well. So really, really happy uh, with the work the team did uh, in 2021. But what stands out here, again, 25% increase in permits process, uh, values increasing substantially. Uh, now, with respect to the, the $100 million valuation, which should be pointed out, uh, that includes uh, the high school and rec center at $49 million. It includes uh, Civic Square at $5.4 million, and also the Lagoon upgrade at $12.8 million. So I don't mean to suggest that it's entirely uh, private projects that are engaged in that. But even with that said, uh, new construction of private investment was substantial. Uh, other industrial permits, for example, have a value of around $15 million. In the previous, in 2020, the value of all permits was $11 million. And the new industrial permits was 15 uh, in this year. So that's pretty great. Uh, and we had 19 new homes uh, with the average. When you look at that value and consider uh, $6.7 million in permit value against 19 homes, that's an average permit value per home of $355,000, which is... Uh, not the value including the land that's simply a construction value so that suggests that a lot of the housing construction was on the higher end of the relative market for coaldale which is not surprising given the fact that cottonwood would represent a substantial amount uh, of that construction yes please thank you uh cam um I'm really impressed with the numbers, and like you say, 25% over over through 2021 is really a good indicator, even through COVID, which is really good news. My question to you is with regards to uh, development permits, and how many p how many permits are you getting, say, for example, uh, below a thousand dollars? Are there any coming in, or or do you do you try to target those as well? Um. I mean, generally speaking, not not very many. 2020, um, COVID was sort of the, the, the initial COVID period was interesting because uh, we saw a lot of, like, a, during the, the start of COVID, we saw a lot of decks being built, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and things of that nature. Uh, you know, people were at home and they were looking for, for projects to do around the house. So we definitely saw that. This year was more about uh, what I might call um, Legitimate construction is definitely the wrong word, but I think you understand what I mean by it. It's it definitely more, uh, you know, uh, building work, more substantial renovations, uh, a lot of major projects um, involved in this in this for sure. Yeah. All construction is legitimate construction for the record. So. So what we like to do is we like to think about things in comparative terms. And so, again, to say, like, well, is, is $15 million of industrial permits uh, good? I mean, it's all $15 million. I mean, if someone offered me $15 million, I'd be very good. But um, for a town the size of Coaldale, is that a large number? Is that a small number? So we like to look at these things from a perspective of, okay, let's look at some of our peers to give ourselves a bit, bit better of an understanding of where we lie. And so when you look at that comparative analysis document that I referenced, we look at the same municipalities every year. And within that document, we really outline two municipalities that are kind of what you might call prime comparators for us. And so those municipalities that we look at most closely are Tabor and Black Falls. 
Tabor is interesting. It's fundamentally the same size. It's within the same economic region, um, same industry, what have you. It's you know within the Lethbridge region. Um, so it's a good thing for us to look at. Black Falls is in a very similar position to Coaldale. It's five minutes outside of Red Deer. Red Deer is a city of about 100,000 people. It's the closest urban to Red Deer. So it has a lot of things that Coaldale has in common. So we like to look at Black Falls as well. With these statistics, uh, we're going to look at building permit data rather than development permit data. Building permit data is different than development permit data. Development permit data, when we talk about those valuations, they're good in terms of understanding at a high level what's happening, but the reality is that on a development permit, we ask the question, how much is this worth? And then a number is written down and we use that to spreadsheet. It's not an exact science. It's not something we review. I mean, people don't have much interest in lying. It doesn't affect your taxes or anything like that, but it's not necessarily perfectly exact. The building permit data is what comes from the building permit process. Uh, we don't engage in the building permit process directly. Superior Safety Codes does that. Superior Safety Codes takes this data and reports it up to Statistics Canada. So this information from one municipality to another is a lot more consistent. And we always want to be comparing apples to apples when we do comparative type work. So from that perspective, we shift to the building permit side which can be a cause uh, potentially for some concern because all of a sudden we'll look at the, this data and you'll notice, well, the rec center, the $50 million rec center development permit doesn't exist on the building permit side. Well, that's because the rec center currently is a, uh, in the process of installing the concrete. The building permit comes a little bit later. It doesn't match up perfectly, but you don't need to be concerned about the fact that the development permit numbers for one year don't match up perfectly with the building permit numbers for one year. Uh, they just happen, the processes that work differently and happen at different. Um, so this, pr it pr again, the purpose of this is to provide a better sense for us of how we're doing and how we compare to other municipalities and, and track for the type of success we're looking for. Lana? So first, looking strictly at uh, the, the building permit data, what we like to do is we like to look at uh, three years because an individual year isn't necessarily indicative of a trend necessarily. And so we always look at things and say, how does it, how does it work in a year? And then what is our three-year average? Uh, and there's some things that come out when you consider the building permit data that's provided. So again, uh, building permit data is a little bit different. In 2021, on the, the right-hand column, uh, we're looking at a big step up in terms of permit values uh, from 2020. Um, going from about $11 million to about $22.5 million, and we're about on par with our three-year average, but that's not really uh, the whole story as far as I'm concerned. The residential numbers, we got about nine, a little over $9 million in uh, residential value, and that's certainly lower than what we saw in 2019 where we had 163 residential permits with a value of uh, $16 million. Um, that's partially, I would suggest, reflective of the fact that we have lower lot availability uh, than what was available in 2019. And so we've talked a little bit about how our growth, our residential growth might be capped a little bit based on the fact that we don't necessarily have all the right type of lot mixes available in the term. Um, developments like uh, the New Rock development, which is likely, you know, the, the New Rock uh, development is the, is the multifamily on the east side of Parkside. Uh, the development permit in, is in place there. The value on the development permit is $6.5 million for those units. And so that'll likely come online in 2022. So I would expect that to be reflective. So that's just one residential development. So we're expecting a fairly solid number in 2022 in this uh, factor. But the industrial commercial permits, um, they lag in terms of total development permit numbers, but the values are the highest they've been. So the building permits do a very interesting job separating commercial and industrial um, and it doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense you generally want to just put those numbers together and say our non-residential values and so from that perspective we're about 12 million dollars in 2021 that compares to about 1.8 million dollars in 2020 and about uh, a little bit under nine million dollars in 2019 the 2019 number is driven largely from the evans trucking uh single building which would have been a, a of that. Uh, again, 
when we look at how we forecast these numbers, uh, values beyond 2022 on the building permit side, uh, 2022 will likely be uh, pretty good, but that's going to start to tail off if we don't have construction beyond that. So now we start to take a look at Coaldale, uh, Tabor, and Blackfalls, and this is just with respect to the existing year. And what we provide there is the residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional value. Um, and what's, what stands out here is to say that our total values are all fundamentally the same. We're all coming in at about $22 million of building permit value. The difference is that uh, Tabor and Blackfalls are driven uh, largely by institutional values, uh, whereas Coaldale is seeing higher numbers with respect to commercial and industrial. And from a residential perspective, uh, a little bit ahead of Tabor. And while we're lower than Blackfalls, we're also, from a population adjusted basis, we're about on par with Which is interesting given that Blackfalls is over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so, Blackfalls is in fact one of the fastest growing municipalities. So keeping pace with them on a residential positive sign for our community. The last one we're doing is to combine these two ideas and say, well, where do we compare to Coaldale and Tabor, or sorry, to Tabor and Blackfalls on a three-year average perspective? And what we see here is to say, well, Blackfalls number is really driven by the fact that they had massive institutional investment uh, in 2019. That's where they uh, and I believe well. But when you look at the commercial industrial side, we're outpacing Tabor and Blackfalls by about $2 million, which represents about 40% uh, compared to those communities on a three-year basis, which is a much better indication of a trend than a single year is. Um, and on the residential side, we're vastly outpacing Tabor, and we're actually on a dollars basis uh, right there with Blackfalls. And again, Blackfalls is about 30% larger than we are. I think it's about 12,000 people. So the fact that we represent the same residential values is a pretty solid sign. Um, we're going to see a fairly significant bump in the institutional side of this category for ourselves in uh, the 2022 version of this report because uh, some of the public we benefited from the same thing uh, 2019 uh, where we had the RCMP station where you know one institutional build so it throws off some of those total numbers a little bit but I think when you look at these numbers, I think what stands out for the town of Coaldale is that we're in a solid position with respect to attracting all types of investment, commercial, industrial, as well as residential, and uh, succeeding in terms of you know growing. Thank you very much. Any questions for Cameron? There was lots of information. I appreciate you doing that for us. One one question I have, and you you alluded to it at the very beginning, the um, the uh, development statistics. So historically, council used to see that document quarterly. Is that going to happen again? Uh, we are doing it biannually. Um, we could produce it quarterly. The reason we produce it biannually is that it's simply a, a function of resource allocation, so it takes time to produce it. And the, the less time we look at it any individual, like we used to produce it monthly, but the, from our perspective, if July is down and August is up, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, so we prefer looking at it on a six month basis because that, we feel that that provides a better snapshot relative to the hours that are put in but if council's preference is to see it court certainly provide that our plan is uh, is to present it here and again in September to provide January through June so maybe our CAO can uh, comment on this as well when we have this new communication person in place is this something that can be updated and be for a lack of a better term live like uh, something happens permit wise this week next week it'll be up on a website is that doable or is that too labor intensive certainly can uh, everything is doable it's just a question of we haven't really heard 
uh, you know, from the general community that this is information that they're clamoring to hear on a sort of a week by week basis. Um, from our perspective, the, the value of these stats is about informing whether or not we're making the kinds of decisions as an organization that incentivize investment and make sure that we're creating an active place for these types of investments. And so providing for the information over a short period of time, um, really the purpose as I see it is to sort of guide and make sure that we're on the right track. Um, so providing the immediate updates is not necessarily a, um, a valuable use of, of the hours associated with it. But I mean, that, that being said, it's certainly something that could be done. Kaylin. Further to uh, Cam Mills here, like we are dividing it up into quarters, um, but you'll notice here in the staff report that there's a, a different theme for each quarterly presentation. Before we had the monthly development stats or the quarterly development stats, and they were an updated spreadsheet that occurred on the agenda under information items, and then we would entertain questions. What we've tried to do here is still make a quarterly appearance, just have more of a specific and unique theme in each of the quarters. One thought that comes to mind with the new communications um, position that we're going to be backfilling is to have a bit of a feature explaining what growth or development is taking place um, on our website or even social media so that we can um, add some of those development statistics to some of the mediums that we use for communication. Whether council would like to see um, the development stats twice a year or four times a year, um, we would just need to hear council's wishes on that. But we, we are going to be appearing before council quarterly. You'll just notice that there's a, a different theme. But it, we, we could update the spreadsheet as part of each of the quarterly updates if that's important for council. Thank you. So personally, I would, I would like to see this one quarterly if that's doable. If I may. Um, would it be possible to simply do the uh, principal uh, sheet on a quarterly basis and leave the the comparative work is really what's time intensive? Yeah, it doesn't need to be the comparative okay. one. The basic sheet, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any comments on that? Okay. Any other questions for Cameron? Okay. Seeing none, could I get someone to sponsor a motion that council accept the planning and community development? Departmental report for information. Councillor Saylor, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thanks, Cam. Moving on to item 10.1, uh, council and committee reports. We have Councillor Chapman will be giving us a uh, a verbal uh, update on the Alberta municipalities meeting that he attended. Thank you, Mayor Van Ryan, and through to Council, I uh, uh, attended the meeting for uh, Municipal Leaders Caucus, it was called, March 9th and 10th. Uh, it was held in Edmonton, and also for those of us who couldn't attend at that time, uh, they, we, they, it was also held uh, Zoom, so it was kind of a dual event in that sense so there were a number of themes at the conference I will speak to three of those themes that I think council might be interested in obviously you may have heard a little bit about some of these so uh, I won't get into into too much detail um, at the conference there were a number of ministers and MLAs who did uh, who uh, did speak as well uh, Minister Rick McIver spoke about uh, the about the government plans for a balanced budget um, he also spoke about the current status of MSI and the role of rollout of to the LGFF, which we spoke about earlier, uh, coming up in 2024. And he feels that its uh, its success and su support will be based on provincial revenues. Uh, that'll be the new takeaway. Uh, they want it to be more predictable and more and provide more attention to needs in order to balance municipal asset management with aging infrastructure in various communities. Um, Minister Raj Ansani uh, spoke about the government priorities uh, in a number of areas, including for water projects, which will be of interest uh, to the town of Coaldale. Uh, one of the big ones uh, for me particularly was about policing in Alberta. And of course, we've had lots of conversations uh, over the past number of years about our policing situation. Uh, Minister uh, Tyler Shandro spoke about the policing matter and of course there are uh, 47 uh, municipal uh, policing uh, agreements in Alberta and seven independent policing services. 
Coaldale was mentioned in the conference. Uh, they singled us out um, uh, individually, being, being that we're the only municipality in Canada and in Alberta who pays 100% for policing. So I was really in, interested to, uh, to hear that, mainly because they've heard our story many a time uh, at AUMA. Now, having said that, I, I, I know that uh, if you look back into our, into our Coldale history books that uh, our Coldale taxpayers have paid 100% of policing costs since the beginning of its policing history. And I was talking with uh, Councillor Pickering earlier today about uh, uh, one of his relatives being one of the first policemen in Coldale back in 1950, approximately 51. And so uh, having said that, we've had, we've had a police force in Coldales from that time to 2003. And then we went to with a regional policing force uh, starting in um, uh, 2003 uh, till December 31st of 2015. And then from there we went to the RCMP uh, policing agreement uh, starting on January 1st, 2016, which uh, uh, Mayor Van Ryan was at. Um, now, the interesting part uh, in, for me in, the con in this convention was the um, Alberta municipalities made a presentation uh, about the results of the report tabled by Price Waterhouse Cooper uh, regarding an Alberta Provincial Police Service model, uh, which was followed by some questions. Um, Alberta municipalities sees a number of di discrepancies in their number in the, in Price Waterhouse Cooper's numbers, so really there was not much debate or for or considerations for a provincial model. So um, with that, uh, the municip Alberta municipalities set out um, a request for decision motion, which reads as that Alberta municipalities strongly oppose the Alberta uh, provincial policing. Uh, model uh, a service models proposed by Pro Price Waterhouse Cooper study and develop an advocacy and communication strategy to advance our position. Um, there was a few more furthers in that uh, one being that if uh, further to uh, further that prior to issuing formal notice to terminate Alberta's contract with the RCMP the government of Alberta put this decision this question to all Albertans in a form of a clear referendum. Um, and if and should significant new information be on the proposal be for forthcoming that Alberta municipalities be open to revisiting this position. So this motion passed with, about, with over 80%. And uh, it, that uh, being that this motion is non-binding, I'm sure we'll be hearing further to that uh, further on from Alberta municipalities. The second um, item that was really interesting for me, again, was uh, the emergency services uh, delivery. And Darren Sandbeck, who is the Director of Emergency Management for the province, uh, shared the presentation on the state of EMS in Alberta. Uh, he spoke primarily about the 10-point plan that the government is implementing to re reduce the response times and to try to get ambulances out of that vortex dilemma once they arrive into the two big cities. Already there's a lot of fatigue from paramedics and it could be even two years before they, he called it the COVID hangover is over. Um, other models in the UK and Al Australia are being monitored to understand what can be done here in Alberta. Um, I spoke after this with our fire chief and director of emergency management for the town of Coaldale, and they've been monitoring uh, daily all uh, all things, including our code red situation in in Coaldale. And I think the short takeaway is that while this 10-point plan might be optically good for a number of municipalities that Cold Elk uh, Chief uh, feels that Cold Elk continues to struggle with a number of those issues that um, affect Cold Elk. Now the director also, uh, Darren Sandbeck, uh, stated that AHS will not be revisiting uh, dispatch consolidation, meaning uh, the last year's discussions uh, and past two years uh, to try to return uh, de uh, centralization back to decentralization. 
He also stated that since the province's transition to provincially run ambulances starting in 2009, um, they're committed to this model so they wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't consider any other models of, of uh, EMS service. Uh, finally, I learned as well that the Alberta Chamber of Commerce is pursuing a resolution, resolution about the concerns over ambulance service and in particular code reds in Alberta. Uh, the last item that I thought was really quite interesting and which uh, Council will really be uh, moving into in the next couple of years and that's the new local government funding framework. And uh, while MSI dealt with the capital operating and the transportation uh, aspects of that framework, the, this new framework will also separate the charter cities from everyone else, which means Calgary Edmonton. And uh, this funding will endeavor to keep pace with the economy. And I spoke with uh, our, our CFO uh, about some of this and he reiterates that our tangible capital asset management will be critical to keep pace with that formula. Uh, this is, this wa it wants to set parallel growth and infrastructure needs so that mus municipalities aren't struggling to find the funds to replace aging assets such, such as, like, as arenas, roads and water and wastewater and storm drainage needs. And many small municipalities currently don't have much in MSI due, due to lower assessment and lower education taxes. The new framework will uh, be neutral to a very variety of local decisions including property taxes and uh, that's my report. Thank you Councillor Chapman. that was a good report. Is there any action items that come out of that for us? I think Council just needs to uh, keep a uh, pulse on uh, two things. One is the MS situation in Alberta and secondly the policing uh, model at this point in time. Um, um, Coldale's uh, position with uh, RRCMP um, is in good standing and I don't see us uh, uh, having to change that model. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Councillor Chopin? Deputy Mayor Avery. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Van Ryan. So I'm just unclear of when this conference was and what was the basis of the conference. There's a lot of information there that um, you know, as a counselor, I didn't even know the conference was happening, first of all, and uh, second of all, I, I just don't, like, I, I'm not, I'm not full on the, the picture of how, how this transpired. Okay, so there's a, um, uh, actually, I'll leave it, Councillor Chapman, can you explain the name of it and where it was held and? This is, uh, I think, a by, um, a, well, it'd be a regularly constituted uh, conference set out by Alberta municipalities, which is the new name for AUMA. And so uh, they hold these conferences at least once or twice a year on top of their AUMA, a regular general AGM convention, which we also attend. So this is um, more of a localized, uh, they called it a municipal leaders uh, caucus uh, that was held this time in Edmonton. There were about uh, 230 people that attended it. So we could vote both. Um, they had this <laughs> interesting voting thing called Mentimeter. And so you could actually vote uh, like on your phone and uh, or by or in person there. So okay. any further questions? Councillor Chapman, would you entertain uh, that we receive your report as information? I'll move that report. Okay. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to correspondence. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, information items 12.1, the uh, Rehoboth Annual Golf Classic uh, being held at Paradise Canyon on Saturday, May 28th. That was part of your council package. I might just say. Put your mic on, please. 
last year, I think council had been invited to attend, and uh, so council had passed a motion to attend, uh, but it was canceled due to uh, COVID reasons. Okay, thank you. Cameron, did you have a comment? Oh, okay. Appreciate that. So, uh, what we've sponsored in the past is the uh, the silver package, one golf pass, uh, one tee box sign, and for four hundred and fifty dollars, Lana, is that correct? Okay. So, is there any appetite to sponsor the twenty uh, seventh annual Rio Both Annual Golf Classic? Councillor Chapman. Uh, sponsored the silver package as proposed. Okay. Any further discussion? Councillor Saylor. Want to do it at because it's going. So the opportunity here is for $450. Uh, for the silver package and then if we want to double that then we can get two golfers but 450 will get us um, into the tournament and recognition I'll pose that question to our municipal clerk Lana do you know what, know what we did in the past um, it is the council's choice of what the denomination is, but in the past we have done four hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, so four hundred and fifty. Okay, so um, who was going to make that motion? Councillor Beekman. Now we uh, sponsor the silver package for four hundred and fifty dollars. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. So we're going to be moving into our closed meeting. And the council goes into closed session at 7.16 p.m. in accordance with Section 197-2 of the Municipal Government Act to discuss matters exempt from disclosure for um, item 13.1, subject to FOIP section, uh, section 16, third party business interests. Item 13.2 and 13.3, subject to FOIP section 17, third party personal privacy. Can I get someone to make that motion? Councillor Reese, any discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Let's take a five minute.